my own experience of recovery and transformation involved writing. Different people move through their understanding in different ways. Uh, so as I was preparing to do this talk, I thought of something that I had written a while ago. Sort of was prior to my becoming open about my background. For many years I worked as a psychologist and didn't reveal except to close friends uh, or my family what my background was. It was not advantageous to go to school and say, you've been hospitalized for schizophrenia. It still isn't. <coughs> the ubiquitous Chinese restaurant with its fast and anonymous service delivers respite from the self-conscious disease the outsider feels when eating alone. While eating my usual quick meal during a break between psychotherapy sessions, I noticed an attractive woman with two small children staring at me from across the almost empty restaurant. Our eyes locked for a few awkward seconds before I could duck my head back into the newspaper I was reading. She seemed determined to enter my 30 minutes of solitude. I forced a smile and tried to remember if I knew her. I was curious. Her demeanor was baffling, not one of friendly recognition, but quizzical. After finishing her dinner, she approached me and asked me if I was a psychologist. I said yes, and I wondered what was coming next. Obviously pleased, she apologized for intruding and began telling me about her friend Julian. He's a psychologist too. Maybe you know him, Julian Wasserman. I saw you and I knew I had to test out one of his funny little theories. He said that if you see a man eating dinner alone in a Chinese restaurant at an off hour, you can bet he's a psychologist in private practice. <laughs> it was 10 years since my last psychiatric hospitalization. I had earned my doctorate in psychology, became licensed, created a successful private practice, and established a uh, reasonably respectable reputation. Apart, apart from old friends and families, few knew that I had been hospitalized twice for more than a year. I wondered, who am I now and how did I get from there to here? How did I avoid profound damage to my mind and spirit? Was it the hard work and determination? Or was I blessed? Or just lucky? I remember spending my 23rd birthday in a psychiatric hospital locked in seclusion and restraint. On the day of my discharge, I felt no relief, no joy. Um, I sat and kind of sank into the chair in the meeting with the psychiatrist at the time of my discharge. My parents were there, and he spoke, not to me, but to my parents. It was as if I wasn't in the room. And he said, your son is a very sick boy. I was 23, but I was still a boy. And he said that he'll have to take medication for the rest of his life. He said I'd have to work at a low stress, low pressure job and accept my limitations. And he also said he has to give up his old friends. They'll be a bad influence on him. And I listened and kind of drifted off when he said, give up your old friends. I was thinking, give up my old friends. What makes him think I'll still have friends when I get out? How was I supposed to explain what happened to me? How was I supposed to make new friends? My weight had loomed up to the highest level I ever had. I look in the mirror and I would see myself looking like a clown and clothes that were too small that didn't fit my old clothes. I rejected that psychiatric verdict. He acted like judge and jury and with the uh, smugness of a bookie who knew all the odds, he told me that. I couldn't accept it. I could not accept stabilization as my overriding goal. In his book, Beyond Culture, anthropologist Edward Hall states, quote, 
the failure to fulfill one's potential can be one of the most devastating and damaging things to occur to a person. Paul says, a kind of gnawing emptiness, longing, frustration, and displaced anger takes over when this occurs. Whether the anger is turned inward on the self or outward through others, dreadful destruction results, unquote. How can we illuminate the varied and complex life stories when we so quickly fit people into categories that are used to explain what they do and who they are? Prominent psychiatrist and researcher John Strauss, who I would assume many of you have heard of, has during the later part of his career started being well, he probably always was very interested in writing and literature, but he teaches a course for residents where, well, maybe he still doesn't, but when I saw him, he said this about five years ago. He teaches them how to write, how to really tell the stories of the people that he sees. He said, you know, he's well attended in a popular course. And he remarks that in his study, he's recognized that it takes a competent biographer more than five years of research before he even begins to attempt to write about the subject. Whereas the mental health professional will have less than an hour, less than an hour to understand and know the life and plight of a mental patient and then prescribe treatment. When we put a person in a category, we save time, but lose much useful information. We shape and twist too much material to make it fit. Our operating knowledge is based on our education and our lived experience. What happens when what we read and what we experience, what we, we were taught and what we experience doesn't fit together? How does a belief system emerge out of that? I'm reminded of the saying that um, of Jeff Lamada's son. I, was, I heard him someplace years ago talking about his father. He said, quote, whatever the mind can conceive and believe is possible. That's what his dad always used to say. He said, never use the word can't. Anything the mind can conceive and believe is possible was the mantra that he grew up with. Well, the converse is most definitely true. If you don't believe in recovery, chances are it won't take place. Perhaps it's time for practitioners to reconnect with the exciting beginnings of their helping profession, <coughs> where there was a belief in the transformative power of thinking, feeling, sharing, and understanding. Know that there is always hope and communicate it. A psychologist by the name of Frank Reisman, who did a lot of work and research with self-help, coined the term the helper therapy principle. And essentially what that means is that when we help somebody else, we get a lot back for ourselves. When we um, talk about self-help and peer support, the kinds of things that I've been doing for the last 10 years in my work, I see the, the, the satisfaction and the positive growth that people who have been in a mental health system as patients for a long time, what they get back when they help somebody else, to always be the one needing treatment to always be on the receiving end. It's not very good for your feelings about yourself, but when you can reach out and help somebody else, you get a lot out of it. 